Hi guys, I'm Danil Hanbali and this is something to consider. Therapy. If I'm being completely honest, my first and favorite exposure to therapy was after I watched one of my favorite movies, Goodwill Hunting. Um, and it was really watching Robin Williams' character and kind of the relationship that he builds with Will, the character played by Matt Damon, that really painted the ideal picture of the kind of relationship I imagined I would have with a therapist if I ever needed one. But as with any movie, it's not always how it works. Still a great movie though. That being said, today we're talking about very specifically psychology clinical psychology. Clinical psychologists have special training in diagnosis and treatment of various mental illnesses. They also have extensive training in psychological assessments and use a variety of therapeutic approaches to help treat patients. My guest on the show today is just that and much, much more. He is a Dutch clinical psychologist who speaks English, German, Dutch, and Arabic. He works with patients with various types of trauma, adjustment disorders, intercultural problems, mood disorders, and relationships. He is specialized in evidence-based treatments and invests a lot of time in understanding the personality of the patient through projective testing before recommending any sort of plan for treatment with the goal of reintegrating patients into their contexts. He is currently working at the German Neuroscience Center in Dubai. Dr. Fabian Sarlous, thank you for joining us and welcome to Something to Consider. Thank you for having me. And by the way, the outfits were not planned. It's complete coincidence. Yeah. I don't know what that says about us and our relationship. <laughs> I already feel like you've analyzed it, but we won't go there now. Dr. Fabian, today's episode is all about working with clinical psychologists or psychotherapists to get a better grasp on your mental health or managing your mental fitness, if you will, because it's an ongoing process. It's not something that is just a treatment and you go. I feel like it's something that you kind of have to manage at different stages in your life. So to kick off, I kind of want to give the audience a bit of context into your background. What do we need to know about the context of your life to understand how your path led you to become a clinical psychologist? Well, um, well, I'm originally Dutch. My parents are Dutch, but I was born and immediately taken to the UAE. And I, actually, I grew up here, mm-hmm. uh, went to different schools, went to a German school, went to a Lebanese school. Um, so I was only 20 years old when I moved back to Holland to study. I actually wanted to study biomedicine. Um, but after one year, I was so much into neurology. Then I thought, okay, fine, let's go for psychology and then maybe medicine. But then I stayed with psychology because I found it super interesting and I learned to better understand myself, how I grew up, how I formed my identity, what is identity in general. Um, yeah. So your interest with the brain really started with questions about identity? Well, the interest in the brain started with the A-level biology, to be (laughs) honest. Um, But at that time, it was really more the brain as an organ. When I went into psychology, it was really more the brain's processes. How does the brain, uh, the brain's responses, etc., lead to our experiences, which can be good, which, which shape our personality or identity? And obviously, professionally now, you know, what led to uh, leads to medic, uh, mental disorders, for example, okay. experiences in general. I'm curious. When I was reading about your background, it says that you got your master's degree in intercultural psychology at the University of Damascus, yeah. and I know that you've also worked with refugees. So, where does your fas- fascination with this part of the world come from when it comes to psychology? Well, as I said, I grew up here in the 80s and 90s, and I was one of the, I don't want to say the first, but one of the few, at least, uh, white boys. <laughs> so all of my friends were Lebanese, uh, Syrian, Palestinian, etc. And I always felt like the odd one out, especially when everyone was speaking Arabic. So I always wanted to learn Arabic in Holland just to get extra points besides studying clinical psychology. I also studied Arabic language and Islam. Um, and then at some point, I just wanted to go to some Arab country and and. and actually do research over there. Um, Now, Lebanon was too expensive and it was too French or American oriented. The UAE at that time didn't have universities. Egyptian, um, well, I wasn't that used to Egyptian dialects. So then Syria was the cheapest option, to be (laughs) honest. And at that time in 2005, six, the Americans had just left uh, Iraq. So there was a high influx of uh, Iraqi refugees in, in Syria. So there was a project open and then I thought, okay, let's do it. 
Um, so then I went to Damascus, spent one year doing research with the University of Damascus together with the Dutch University. And this is then how I got my second master in what we can then call intercultural clinical psychology. Can you give us a little bit more context on your role as a clinical psychologist? What does that exactly mean? So what do you specialize in exactly? Yeah. Um, well, as a clinical psychologist, I'm, I'm specialized in, in mental uh, disorders. So not just people who have uh, psychosocial issues, but who actually suffer from uh, certain symptoms like depression, anxiety, panic attacks, uh, and the like. So where you can see that mood is clearly dysregulated and people can't function in normal life or in their context, so with their family or at work anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, my specialization because of my Syria experience with, with the refugees is, is more in, in trauma and trauma you ask me as a psychologist, I believe everything is related to trauma, but psychiatrically it's seen as a, as a specific disorder. However, what you see in trauma, people have gone through something uh, severe or have interpreted an experience as, 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 as very negative and consequently suffer from uh, depressive complaints or feel heavy, uh, always feeling sad, interpret everything negatively or pessimistically. And they may also experience anxiety, so they're constantly agitated, constantly on their guards, fearing that the negative uh, event may reoccur or that they're being judged again, etc. So their mood is modulating between depression and anxiety. Sometimes even anger comes into play if there is a particular perpetrator, a rapist or political ideology, etc. But because the brain is very much programmed into recognizing these uh, triggers, you can see that they have difficulties functioning in normal life. So life doesn't make sense anymore. They don't want to get out of bed. When they leave the house, they get anxious. When they see or hear or smell a certain thing, immediately the brain responds with anxiety and, and a protective response, uh, which may happen at work, may happen at the supermarket. Yeah. So as a clinical psychologist, you're trained to really understand that type of behavior and help cope with it? Well, there are two parts of it. On the one hand, understanding. So it involves assessments, psychological tests, for example, lots of interviews. Mm -hmm. However, you want to help someone. You want to decrease the suffering. So the bigger focus is obviously on psychotherapy. So using that understanding in correcting their ways of thinking or how thoughts and emotions, and in particular memories, obviously interact in producing that dysfunctional experience. I want to come back to correcting emotions in a second, but I want to go into trauma a little bit more mm. because I remember in some of our early conversations, this was such an educational moment for me when, when you were teaching me about the concept of what trauma can be. You know, a lot of the time when we hear the word trauma, we associate it to really big things, war, God forbid, some sort of sexual assault, um, plane crashes, earthquakes. But you were you talked to me about how sometimes trauma can stem from events that are socially seen as maybe even smaller than that. Things like divorce, uh, being adopted as a child, uh, being abused uh, verbally or physically, um, having issues with people that you work with. And it's the judgment of the event that kind of... Uh, spirals people's conversation around trauma out of control because trauma as a concept has nothing to do with the event itself. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, trauma in Greek means wound. Mm -hmm. So it could be anything. It's a very subjective thing. Whatever I consider or whatever I experienced as significantly emotionally overwhelming. So it's an emotionally overwhelming event. And in that sense, it's subjective. Yes, indeed, we can agree that a rape or a war or abuse or a car crash are traumatic or can be traumatic. We also see that some people, they recover very quickly. They just have the shock phase, then the readjustment phase, and then they're all fine. Some people actually gain strength out of it. But most trauma is what happens in relationships, how we treat one another. So in that sense, my, mom's, my mom having a headache and screaming at me that I, when I was four years old, making me believe that I'm not lovable, that already could be considered a trauma. Wow. The teacher screaming at me or making me believe that I'm a failure mm -hmm. can be considered a trauma. The thing with trauma is it's, it's an emotionally overwhelming event and the brain immediately sucks up everything related to it, not only the images, the sounds, the storyline, but also 
makes interpretations. So mom screaming at me means I'm not a good child, I'm not lovable. And the brain stores it in memory because the brain is made for our survival. The brain thinks, okay, for the sake of our survival, I need to hold on to this because these situations could reoccur. Mm -hmm. Which means, however, if the brain is connecting all of this information in a memory network that maybe next time when, the, when I hear someone scream or I see someone put on that face, my brain imme will immediately consciously or unconsciously recognize the situation and activate this whole anxiety network. First of all, protect yourself, mm. shut down, make yourself small. But not only that, also the, 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 the implicit interpretation, I'm a failure or I'm not lovable. Mm. So we see that even after the trauma has happened, so post trauma, the brain is still producing stress. And this is something very human, obviously, we, we, we tend to suppress our emotions. And as a child, you don't know how to respond. So clearly you will suppress. The longer it stays suppressed in active memory, it's not moving to passive or to long term memory, the longer it stays in active memory, the longer it, 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 it will lead to symptoms or it will build up even. Okay, interesting. So in that sense, I believe that even depression, anxiety disorders, OCD, all kinds of disorders other than the hardcore psychiatric ones like schizophrenia, but all of these affective disorders have a root in trauma with some significant, subjectively significant event. Interesting. But I mean, if if we're talking about it fundamentally, this, this idea of it, because I got this question quite a bit from other people that were interested in learning more about trauma, the severity is 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 really something that is defined by you not by others subjective exactly i can step on your foot and you can feel immense pain uh -huh. but for me it was just a slight touch on your foot exactly so and it's us storing that trauma in our minds and interpreting it uh, in a specific way where it means something to us and then not necessarily dealing with it and it coming up later in life that that kind of ends up becoming our trigger Wow. Can you talk to us a little bit about, oh, I'd love to get technical and I know you got your, your model in here and I love when you do this. Can you talk to us about what happens to the brain when someone experiences trauma and how that potentially changes how it works? Mm -hmm. Here we have a brain. Yeah. Obviously the brain has two hemispheres. We have a left hemisphere. We have a right hemisphere. Now in general, even though both of them obviously work together, but the left hemisphere it's the seat of our long-term memory, all the facts, knowledge, analytical information and routine things are stored in the left hemisphere. And as such, it's not really that much emotional. There's not that much electricity. The right hemisphere, on the other hand, is the more creative part of our brain. So it combines information from the outside with maybe information from the left side into making an interpretation or attaching meaning to things. Now. If we look at brain scans, we can see that usually the right side is the, uh, it's the bigger part of our brain. And not only that, if you look for electricity, we see that the right side is usually more dominant. There's more electricity here as well. Now, if you look in detail in the right hemisphere, so the uh, brain has four different regions. We have the back part, which is the part responsible for senses. We have the middle part, which is the part responsible for my body, so breathing, uh, heart rate, uh, muscles, etc. And we have the frontal part, which is also the part which really makes us human. Cats, dogs, we see a brain shaped like this. This is where our thinking is taking place, um, so where the brain is combining information. Now, what happens when we get traumatized or when we go through a uh, significantly emotionally overwhelming situation? So my brain perceives it. The images, the sounds, the sensations, etc. everything enters the brain and rips, goes from the back to the front. So first the sensory areas are activated in order to create that image of that car crash, for example. Electricity increases, reaches the physical areas, and then my brain gets the input. Oh, we need to, to, to produce a response in order to save ourselves. So breathing goes up because we need more oxygen. Heart rate goes up because the oxygen needs to be distributed. Metabolism goes up because we need more sugars to, to produce energy and cortisol, uh, adrenaline, etc. certain hormones to, to stretch out the energy response. And muscles get active in order to produce motion. 
Now, the brain obviously is stuck in the skull. The brain is not moving by itself. And this is why we actually call it an e-motion. So the mm. brain is sending a signal down to the body in order for you to move either towards the stimulus or the situation, approach or fight, or away, avoid flight, go away from the negative stimulus. Okay. So the survival response or the protective response happens, everything goes in milliseconds, so we perceive it as the same moment. But technically speaking, the, the physiological response, the emotion happens before the thought comes. Electricity goes up, we create a response, and then the brain creates an interpretation. Oh, mom doesn't love me, for example. Or I could have died. Something negative in, you know, in accordance, obviously, with that particular emotion. So we see that people who are, for example, uh, have a lot of sadness, they will produce all kinds of thoughts, which include a minus or a loss. They become more pessimistic. No one likes me. Life doesn't have sense, etc. People who have a lot of anger build up, they will be uh, forming thoughts related to boundaries. Everyone's against me. Uh, people are out to get me. They become a little bit paranoid, etc. The interesting thing is with anxiety, because anxiety is always related to situations which are in which we are unsafe or uncertain, insecure, the brain will think, Oi, do I need to fight? Do I need to run away? The muscles are getting active, breathing is going up. This obviously is a dangerous situation. And the brain starts overanalyzing, mm -hmm. not only doubting what's happening on the outside world, should I do this or that, chocolate or vanilla, but also doubting myself. Am I good? Am I strong or not? Now, the brain is made for our survival, so the brain will always go for the most negative interpretation because that's the one which helps our survival. So, in, 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 the, in uh, mom screaming at me, for example, I'm not going to be aware of, oh, mom, she gave birth to me, she fed me, mom loves me. No, mom is screaming at me, mom looks pretty grumpy now, mom doesn't love me. I'm a bad child. Now, the problem with it is that if they if emotionally speaking, and emotions technically are electricity, the electricity load is so strong on these connections, these connections strengthen. So the interpretation, sorry, just to, so to make sure I understand this correctly, I'm, I'm going to call it a story. Mm -hmm. the, sto the repetition of that story strengthens its power in your brain? Yeah. Okay. Because when I repeat the story, just by thinking back about it or talking about it, the brain has to activate different areas. So you're so going back to the initial memory. If you tell me ah. about mom screaming at you in the kitchen, your brain will produce while you're looking at me, but in your mind, you will get the image of the kitchen and mom's face. And in your mind, you might even be able to reproduce the sound of her voice as she was screaming at me. So electricity goes up in the back. Interpretation is up as well, because you're telling me about an experience in which you felt unloved. And at that same moment, the brain will think, Oh, my God, here we go again bring up the anxiety. And this is what you see with clients as well. The moment they start uh, telling me about what they've been through, they get emotional. Word-wise, they try to weasel their way around because they don't specifically want to tell me what has happened because that's too emotional. And some of them may even lose control over their body. The shaking starts, the crying starts. Um, they can't maintain eye contact anymore. Um, so we see that they are I don't want to say building up to a flashback, but they are reliving or re-experiencing that event, mm. which means the right hemisphere gets active again. It makes sense that this is what technically happens, but it's also unfortunate because it reminds me of how people react to traumas or things that uh, are happening with someone's mental health is that they keep encouraging you to suppress it for that exact same reason. Yeah. But what happens when you suppress it? Well, when you suppress it, you put the barrier here. I'm now trying to distract myself. However, the tension is already up. Okay. And emotions, there's the E in it because the brain wants to let go of that motion. Uh -huh. They stay, which means if I suppress it, I'm technically holding on to it. My tension level is already higher. And concentration, for example, or other things, yes, I may be able to now talk about uh, chocolate cakes, for example. But in the back of my mind, my tension level is already higher. I'll be more nervous. So it stays. And that translates physiologically throughout your body. So that tension can be seen. Well, the problem is the longer it lasts, mm. 
the more it literally changes our body, in particular anxiety or stress-related disorder. Really? We know there is a direct link to diabetes, for example, because your metabolism is constantly functioning at a higher level. Cardiovascular disease, if you constantly think or are reminded uh, of the trauma or you constantly have to suppress it, you're being abused and, and, and that abuser is constantly around you, but you have to smile. It means your body is constantly believing, okay, you need to run, you need to run, you need to fight, you need to fight, which means your heart keeps beating higher and higher and higher and higher. Wow. So even this idea of your body being in, const in a constant state of survival can lead to something as extre extreme as a cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, the interesting thing in that context is if we look at burnout, for example, which is yeah. not fully officialized as a, as, a, as, a, as a clinical diagnosis. However, if we look at the symptoms which come with burnout, it's very close to PTSD. The only big difference being that in PTSD, the trauma is usually considered something life-threatening, while in burnout, it's something very abstract, like time pressure, expectations, um, responsibilities, for example. And responsibility, you can't fight it, you can't run away from it. It's something we humans have created through our overthinking. Time the same thing. Wow. Time is a construct. But our brain, 85% of our brain is technically still an animal brain. It will respond with survival mechanisms. So if I believe I'm overloaded with responsibilities, and then obviously limited time, and I have to live up to them because otherwise I'm not a good person, or I'm not a good employee, then my brain will think, okay, fine, you need to run, you need to fight, bring up the breathing, the heart rate, whoops, adrenaline up. And essentially, obviously, the brain is a body, it has its limits, then we get into a stage that you're completely depleted, literally burned out. Yeah, what it's called this way, obviously. And then the fatigue and the depression, etc, all the other symptoms come up. So if I were to ask you, how does someone recognize that, you know, these symptoms are severe signs of a PTSD, depression, an anxiety disorder, some sort of burnout, like how does one realize, because it takes a while for, I, I can tell from my own experience, it took me a while to admit it to myself and to be okay with it. So how does one recognize the red flags? Well, acceptance is a different thing. The presence of emotions, in particular when you are in a certain situation and you can identify the trigger or the thought or the memory, whenever you think about it, it makes you sad, angry or anxious, then if you ask me, it would, I would already consider it a trauma. If you can think about something or be exposed to something and it doesn't make you emotional, then it's not traumatic. Okay. Then it's okay, I can handle it. But what you said is an interesting thing. Um, it took some time for me to accept it. Mm -hmm. And there's something blocking that acceptance, because if I were to accept it, maybe it means that I'm a weak person. Yeah, absolutely. So the burnout is actually secondary. There's something underlying it, not wanting to be a weak person. Correct. And where does that stem from? Voila. Interesting. And that one, I, therapeutically, I would find more interesting. Interesting. Because if you can go to that core and you can treat it, desensitize it, whatever, then not only do you increase self-confidence and then obviously someone's overall experiences in various situations, but also you, you, you get rid of the burnout. Interesting. And sounds very familiar. You've done such a good job of painting a picture of what would lead to a potential consultation. And I feel like uh, whether it's me or my audience, we're all more or less familiar with therapy being uh, talk centric. But EMDR as a treatment plan was new for me. Uh, and I know that this is something that you specialize in. So I'm very interested in my audience learning a little bit more about your approach. If you can give us a little bit of background on it as well. What are the basic principles? And then we go into the technique yeah. because a lot of people are very curious as to what, in what exactly it entails. See, psychotherapy is, is, is a form of treatment which is already a hundred years old. Obviously, Freud being the first one to having installed it, psychoanalysis, which was all based on um, well, people suppressing certain drives, mm -hmm. usually sexual or aggressive in, in Freudian terms, um, which they have learned or projected onto um, significant others, mom and dad, if, if you want to go Freudian. And his therapy was more based on talking. So we have to uncover these drives or these unconscious wishes, needs, etc., by digging into memory. Now, digging into memory, 
here we go, yani means through talking, we have to activate the frontal lobe because we need to talk about it. And that already in requires a certain level of insight, of intelligence, and obviously philosophically or scientifically, we need the concepts, you need the models to, to put that drive or that problem into. Now, 50 years later, neuroscience was growing in the 60s, 70s. The big focus was on the CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, which is based on the assumption that if I change the cognition, the thought, my interpretation my, of it, exactly, my emotions will change and thus I will behave differently. Okay. So for example, maybe a stupid example, but recognizable for everyone. If I have fear of flying okay. and obviously people always believe that, oh my God, we're going to crash. So in CBT, we would tell people, we will provide people with, with correct information or a different way of thinking. So for example, more the plane you've never crashed in a plane this never you never experienced this and then we would assume that the emotions would change so suddenly you're not anxious anymore mm -hmm. or i would tell you the plane is the safest vehicle the car is more dangerous i don't know if that's the best interpretation but plane is safe sit in the plane you'll be fine so to an extent they would ground you would they would try to ground you in facts it's a top-down therapy. So okay. you use the human part, the thinking part through words, which are only an approximation to emotions, obviously, but and try to change the perspective. Okay. However, what we frequently see is that, okay, fine, the plane is the safest vehicle. I've never crashed before. I sit down in the plane, doors close, do it as I'm sitting down, etc. And suddenly, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. The emotion keeps going up and I can tell myself as much as I want, I'm safe, stewardess is smiling, never crashed before. Nevertheless, my heart starts beating, my, 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 my muscles get active. And at some point, the anxiety or that emotion may, treat, may reach such a level that no matter what I tell myself or what I believe, my brain will tell me, no, you're unsafe here. We need to run. Mm. So we see that CBT is very limited. Yes, it may help in people who are who are missing information, who have very abstract issues. Mm. But suffering is usually emotionally. Thoughts, they are just statements, they're interpretations. I'm a failure, I'm not a failure. Depends on how I want to look at it. However, pain is pain. Anxiety always involves breathing, heart rate, muscle activation. Sadness always involves a heavy feeling. And people suffer from emotions, not necessarily thoughts. Or obviously they suffer from how they feel about certain thoughts, but the emotional part is the more important part. And that is something that EMDR could help with? Yes. Okay. What we found out much later is obviously, even if we look at the brain, emotions are produced in 85% of our brain, thoughts only in 15% of the brain. It's not about changing the thoughts. Emotions usually stay, as I said, but the, the, the task is more to have a bottom-up approach, change the emotions. Because if I sit in the plane and I feel very relaxed, I'm, 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 I'm not anxious or sad or whatever at all, I'm going to crash. I'm not going to crash. I'm going to read the Duty Free magazine. Um, these statements or, or, or thoughts are just, as I said, statements. Mm. So talk to me about EMDR. So EMDR is a bottom-up therapy, which is not that much focused on thoughts or changing thoughts like CBT. EMDR is more focused on changing emotions. Now, as I said, especially if we look at trauma, we can see that emotions are basically stuck in the right hemisphere of the brain and constantly being suppressed. In CBT, if we talk about it the whole time, as I said, the chances are that the emotion is going to flare up. Words are not enough to express an emotion. And what I see with a lot of clients, they tend to suppress their emotions during the sessions as well. So they break down in the car. In EMDR, we ask actually people to think back about the negative memory, put themselves back into that trauma and allow that emotion to actually build up and come out. Mm -hmm. But not only that, in EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, we actually provide a distracting or bilateral stimuli, left, right, left, right, left, right. Okay. Now, EM, eye movement, what we found out is that when our eyes are moving, left, right, left, right, left, right, as they do in REM sleep, actually, both hemispheres are bilaterally getting active. 
Ah, so the movement of the eyes activate the brain. In the brain, everything is diagonal. Okay. So if I look to the left, the right side gets active. Okay. But if I look to the right, my left side gets active. Okay. If I do this a lot of times at a certain frequency and speed after each other, both parts of the brain sequentially get active, which improves the communication between the left and the right hemisphere. Okay. And at a certain speed and intensity of eye movements, similar to that in REM sleep, mm -hmm. when the brain is dreaming, and that's the stage when the brain is processing emotions and or memories. So if we can induce the same environment in the brain as if you were in REM sleep, at a certain point your brain believes, okay, we're vibing that way, we need to process emotions. Now, if at the same moment you think back about the traumatic event or the trigger or the negative thought or you focus on your emotions, your brain will think, oh, this is what we need to process. So move it to the left, long-term memory, the less emotional side. This is then how we can process or desensitize experiences because at a certain point enough electricity has reached the left hemisphere, the brain is balanced out in its electrical potential which also means when I think back about that memory or I see that trigger again or I activate that thought because emotionally it's not triggering me anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a bad experience in my life. Mm. The thought is just a statement and my heart is doing what it's supposed to do. It's pumping blood. So, so it's been desensitized. I completely understand how the eye movement activates your brain to go into that state let's yeah. call it and i understand the idea of when you are in that state especially because you've been quote unquote triggered by going back to that memory while you're in the midst of doing this rapid eye movement i understand how that works but where does the the vibration and the sound come into play because it's a three-part series it for was, those that don't know it was developed by using the eye movements. That's okay. why it's called EMDR. Okay. Um, however, as science progress, so in the old times we were using the finger, so follow the finger. Mm -hmm. However, we found that it's very difficult to produce these eye movements because the speed, the intensity, me keeping the correct position to, to produce the best eye movements, obviously is very difficult. And if you have eight or 12 sessions on a day, then your arm will fall off. Now, Technology obviously also advances. So now we have a light bar, which has a light going left, right, left, right, left, right, and you just follow the light. Okay. However, it's about sensory stimulation. Mm -hmm. So what we found out, it doesn't necessarily always need to be the eye movements. So now we can use sounds as well. So what I have, for example, is a device which produces beeps on both mm -hmm. ears, left, right, left, right, left, right. Mm -hmm. And obviously the auditory areas in the back of your brain, left and right hemisphere will perceive the sound and start vibing this way as well. Add to it a third one, I also have pulses, which will start vibrating just like mobile phones, left, right, left, right, left, right, synchronous to the sound and the light if you're using the light bar. So in this sense, we're stimulating visual, auditory and tactile areas in the back of the brain, which actually makes it more intense. And the good thing with using a device is obviously that the speed and the intensity and the volume, etc., can be manipulated, it can be adjusted. Mm -hmm. And that's where your role comes in. Movements. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Now, what we saw there was um, during the lockdown, mm. there was a video of Prince Harry. Prince Harry was going to therapy and he also used EMDR, but because of the lockdown, he had to do, as an, do it in his villa. Mm. Um, so they couldn't use the device. However, what he used was tapping. Correct. And when I tap myself, I feel the tap, I hear the tap. Mm. And if I do this a lot of times after each other, even though it may look a little bit ridiculous, but both hemispheres sequentially get activated and my brain gets into a processing mode as well. It's interesting because now you're showing us an example of tapping on your shoulders, but I've been seeing a lot of ads on Instagram that now there's a trend happening where people are taking their two fingers and tapping on their forehead, this tapping movement. I don't think it's exactly EMDR, but it's promoting this idea of kind of grounding yourself and grounding your thoughts. Um, it's it's a new wave type of therapy called emotion focus therapy, I believe. Um, it's not that scientifically founded. Or there aren't that many studies about it at all, actually, because it's not okay. being taught or studied by academia. So it's different. It's um, not related to the same it's, it's tap therapy thing. on the shoulders. It's a different thing. And I don't know that much about it, so I, I can't say that much. But mm. what you're saying now, I'm just tipping my forehead. It's not bilateral, Yanni. It's, 
it's the bilateral both areas of the brain would get activated mm -hmm. um so i wouldn't consider i don't think it's that effective um, but your example of Prince Harry was interesting because a couple of people have asked, you know, is this something that can be done with a therapist virtually or do they need to, if to properly benefit for it, do they need to be face to face? I have a very good friend who's only doing it virtually. So she has a computer program and wow. the one on the other side is seeing a ball going left, right, left, right, left, right. So you have to follow the screen. I tried it during the lockdown. I didn't like it because people have to go very close to the screen which is already painful, can be bad for your eyes. B, I'm very much into the auditory and the tactile stimulation. I don't like the eye movements at all because when you're producing these eye movements, you have to tell yourself left, right, left, right, left, right. So it's intentional. So it's taking away part of the concentration from thinking back about the memory and experiencing mm -hmm. the emotions. Plus it can lead to eye problems. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a huge fan of these online programs. I think with a therapist is also always better Plus, in addition to that, if we think of, in particular, any real, any severe PTSD, so rape, war, once the memories and the emotions are coming up, people become unstable. Mm. So it's good to have a therapist or at least another person in the room who can calm you down or who can stop you. Now, I had some clients who were um, uh, abused when they were very young uh, by pedophiliacs, etc., what sometimes can happen is that these memory networks get so active that people get a flashback and suddenly that 50-year-old man turns into a five-year-old boy and starts crying. In the room. Yeah, yeah. Right then and there. So that memory, that trigger is so powerful that they actually go back to that moment. And this is what we call dissociation. Sometimes people dissociate and re-experience the full thing, mm. which therapeutically obviously is very interesting because it means, okay, the trauma is here right now and now we can actually change it. However, these people are suffering. If this were to happen online, my client is somewhere in China yeah. and the window is open. My biggest fear is always clients you know, committing Doing suicide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would find that pretty scary and I, I, I don't want to be the one responsible for that. So I want to be in control. Fair enough. But I mean, while we're on this subject, can you give us a little bit of um, an idea of what patients should expect from EMDR? I can talk about my own experience, but it's interesting. I, I'd love to hear things like the success rates and, you know, you know, do people, uh, do, are people considered cured after a couple of sessions or is it expected for people to come back? Mm. Because I'll, I'll tell you it, I've done, I've done four official EMDR sessions. I did six sessions before that. So all in all 10, and I'm in a much more comfortable place now mm. to kind of reintegrate into my life and go back to my routine. And if I want to do it again, I'll, I'll go back and do it, but I don't feel the need to continue for for now until forever. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Well, if we compare CBT to EMDR, CBT is talk-based, mm -hmm. which means you, know, you need to think in a different or need to interpret things in a different way, learn how to think in a different way, which means constant reactivation and reminding yourself in the plane, no, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe. Um, so it requires discipline as well. And CBT is a lengthy process, if you ask me. It requires homework, etc., which most clients aren't willing or able to do even um so cbt is usually maybe three months up to even years mm -hmm. emdr is a completely different approach it, it's not that much based on, on on talking it's more based on experiencing and allowing these emotions to come out so the brain correcting itself by letting out what for years i've been suppressing If, if we, there aren't that many studies yet on EMDR, this I admit, because EMDR is only 20 years old, CBT is 60 years old, maybe. Um, however, if we look at effect rates, EMDR is faster and more effective than CBT. Um, why? Because it's a bottom up approach. You change emotions. And once emotions are neutralized, as I s keep saying, Yanni, the thought is just a statement. While in CBT, I can change my thoughts. So it happens very frequently that, for example, I have someone coming in with panic disorder. You tell them, ah, oh, distract your thoughts, calm down your body, the usual CBT approach, learn different ways of thinking, maybe focus on God, start praying much more. Indeed, the panic symptoms go down mm -hmm. by using religion, for example, 
But now this person develops OCD. Yeah. How many rakat have I prayed? Have I done what do correctly? So we see the anxiety is jumping. With EMDR, however, you desensitize that anxiety, which means not only the traumatic mem or, or the memory, but also whatever was stored in this memory network does not produce anxiety anymore. So really what it is, is that we're dealing with the source of the problem versus just trying to change the way we think about the problem. And I think that's kind of the easiest way to show the difference maybe between CBT and EMDR. Rather than the content of the problem, mm -hmm. we're changing the programming. The programming. The processing. Yes, of that it, we're changing emotion. the programming of that problem. Exactly. That was the word that you used. I like it. Um, what are the long term effects of not finding healthy ways to cope with mental health? See, on the one hand, as I said, you know, in mental health, usually we're talking about emotional disturbances which affect our body. That's why emotion is a word motion in it. So we're talking about um, heart acceleration, we're talking about metabolic disorders, uh, diabetes, for example, uh, muscle atrophies, um, all kinds of, of, of what we then call somatic disorders or physical disorders which have their uh, origin in something psychological. But not only that, obviously, once I see, oh, my heart is beating the whole time, or, oh my God, now I'm a diabetic, that alone will lead to even more anxiety, changes in my lifestyle, which then perpetuate that anxiety or sadness in particular. Um, what are the long-term consequences? Obviously, for my body, they can be severe. Mm -hmm. Mentally, at some point, I do actually believe, because this is the information my body is giving me, that I'm weak or that I'm not good enough. My concentration, my attention may go down, I'm not able to perform at work or in relationships, which means I'm a failure, I'm a loser. I am not lovable because people walk away if I'm always cranky or if I, if I don't want to go out anymore. So really what it does so, is just perpetuate this ongoing narrative in your life yeah. that's going to continue to affect you in different ways, sometimes even physical, as we've yeah. already covered. But there's something that a lot of people don't talk about, especially when it comes to trauma. I want to touch on it before, very quickly before we close. Grief. I think grief is such a big topic. There are a lot of assumptions about it, especially how does one really cope with grief, whether it's losing a child, a family member, a partner, grieving the loss of the person that you used to be versus the one that you are today. How does someone prepare for a journey like that? Grief is a very interesting one. If we, if we look at trauma, and it usually involves a threatening situation, a fight or flight response. That's why we build up that anxiety and we either fight or we run away, but we do something. When it comes to grief, um, something which was very dear to me, I mean, where a lot of emotions were connected to, has suddenly disappeared, which means my brain has to move something from active memory, as this person being present, to a passive long-term memory. The person is not physically here anymore. And in order to do that, the brain will go through various emotions. There's always shock, there's denial, there, there's anger, bargaining. Or, and then the most painful part, which is obviously the sadness, the real depression. However, when it comes to grief, it's, it's a very, I don't want to say primitive, but it's a very basic emotion. We can see that even animals may grieve, mm. dogs, or when, when, when they lose their master, for example. And we have to go through all of these stages. So the sadness, the it's part of, of the process by which the brain is changing the meaning or the interpretation related to the lost object into a different one. So this person is, my father is not here anymore physically. He's an angel, for example. Mm. So religion, obviously, in that sense may help. Um, and the emotion is part of that. So to move it to the left. So you almost EMDR. do have to, sorry, I just like, so what you really have to do, you, you have to go through the motions of it to get through it. There's no easy way around something like grief. Grief, not really. Psychiatrically, we say if it lasts for more than, because we see that the brain should um, adjust to changes, according to studies at least, within two months, which means what, what, we, uh, what we use when it comes to diagnosis, etc. If grief lasts longer than two months, it may be classified as complicated grief or an adjustment disorder. If it lasts even longer, it might even be diagnosed as a depression. And then you would take someone in for therapy. Interesting. Now, what EMDR can do, EMDR can speed it up. 
Okay. Because you you promote the release of that emotion and obviously the the, the communication or the transfer to the other hemisphere. So it may speed up the whole process. However, grief is usually related to something to the loss of something very dear, very valuable. And this may be very philosophical, but but if you don't suffer the loss, then the loss didn't have that much value. We only know what we've got when it's gone. So what you see after successful grief is that I can still think about the loss object. There is sadness coming up, which we then call melancholy. Mm. Um, but it may sound a little bit macabre maybe, but we enjoy thinking back about the lost object, despite it being sad or, yeah. or painful. But it's the positive memories coming up rather than the negative memories, for example. I love that. I think that's a very poetic way to describe it. I heard it once described as, uh, you know, grief is, is especially when you get to the acceptance part, it is the culmination of unexpressed love, um, which is, which is nice. And I think there, there, there is something important to going through all of the steps before accepting it. The problem is, I mean, so what got me into EMDR, I mean, my, my father passed away when I was young. Mm. While I was studying, actually, so this, amongst others, is one of the reasons which really got me into psychology and particular trauma. My father had cancer, was in a hospital, hooked up to the machines, and I still remember the machines beeping slower and slower and slower. And at some point it was quiet. My father passed away. Now, I remember that just thinking back about that always would break me down. I couldn't work in hospitals. I couldn't hear beeps because it would always remind me of, of my father. At some point, I even thought that I can smell cancer. Cancer has a particular smell and I could smell it all around me. Wow. As a psychotherapist, obviously, you have to go to therapy yourself. So I tried psychoanalysis and CBT, which all came with different interpretations. It's in the past. It's, it's my sublime expression of anger towards my father. That's the whole Freudian thing etc. But, but the symptoms remained. Mm -hmm. What happened when I did EMDR, I mean, the emotions, the sadness came up and at a certain point I could look at the images or the memories obviously of my father passing away, the machine slowly coming down, um, the breathing stopped, um, but I didn't need to cry. It didn't make me emotional anymore. It changed the way you remembered it. Well, uh, and the good thing now is when I remember my father, it's not the images of my father lying in bed or the other complications, the times he went to the hospital, how he looked when he was really sick, the beeping. When I think of my father now, it's the happy memories which come up. Mm -hmm. Even some memories of my father, I don't know, hitting me because I deserved <laughs> it, I admit, but I'm happy. Yeah. Even though it's an objectively a sad memory, but it takes more digging now to retrieve and, and reconstruct the memory of my father lying in bed, being all sick. The beeping doesn't trigger me anymore. Wow. I mean, I feel like you've given us so much to consider, to be honest. Before we close, I have a question for you, and then I have a request. Um, how has you going through therapy and EMDR, aside from the obvious results that you talked about and the way that you remember that painful memory, how has it changed your relationship to others in your life, whether it be your family, your wife, your children? I'd be interested to know if you're willing to share. Um, see, I think we humans, we're so much focused on, on how people are thinking. We're constantly critical, judging, opinions are important, etc. Now I'm, I'm more focused on emotions. It doesn't matter whether I agree or disagree with my wife. If my wife is angry, I need to protect her. If my wife is sad, I need to comfort her. Even though I, I mean, her not getting that particular handbag does not necessarily make <laughs> me say quite the opposite. But focus more on emotions. If my son is crying or anxious or angry because Santa doesn't exist, I can't tell him, no, Santa doesn't exist. And, and, and try to argue with him. I need to calm him down. So through years of different types of psychotherapy and then EMDR, I learned that, as I said, emotions are what we suffer from and emotions are the most important thing. And even in communication, we say that 30% of our communication is verbal, 70% are our intentions, our motivations, the emotions which I'm trying to convey. Mm -hmm. So it's better to focus on emotions and to comfort someone in these emotions rather than 
me stating my opinion or, or me trying to correct you verbally about something. I love that so much. I think that is such an enlightening thing to say. Thank you for saying that. I think a lot of people, you're going to give a lot of people, I think, uh, a different way to look at this. My last request before we close, uh, I usually ask my guests, what question would you pose to me based on the topics that we've covered in this episode? What would you like me to consider? What would I like you to consider? Or maybe what I said last. Don't be so judgmental. Don't be so critical. If something goes wrong, then it went wrong. But how do you deal with the sadness or the anxiety or, or the anger? That's more important. So don't swallow it up and let it out at the taxi driver, for example. Um, if you're in a safe place and you can cry, cry. Embrace so, the emotion. Exactly. And when it comes to, to anxiety, if your heart is beating faster and your breathing is up, do some cardio, use that. You know, your metabolic rate is high, you lose much more weight, build more muscle. Focus much more on, on your emotions and use them in your advantage. I think that's great. That's great advice. And I will mm. consider it. And I have considered it very much so. Dr. Fabian, thank you so much for making the time to be here. I can't tell you how much knowing you has been such an eye-opening experience for me. It has truly been a privilege, and I hope our listeners will feel the same. Thank you so much for thank being here. Thank you much here. more. To all our listeners, I want to thank you for the privilege of your time. If you enjoyed the episode, please like, comment, share, as it really helps us grow this platform. Also, please subscribe or follow the podcast wherever you listen to it. Any and all support is very much appreciated. Please do feel free to reach out with any feedback that you have on the content or share what resonated most. We would love to hear it all. In the meantime, I hope you found something to consider.